Well, welcome to another study. I hope everyone is hungry, not for your physical food, but for the spiritual food that this chapter so clearly is going to feed us with this afternoon. If we get through the end, then I don't know if we're going to get through the whole thing because it's a long chapter, although this is a material that we have read before and come across on especially Herald in the Loud Cry. Yes. Before, so we might be able to, but if we come to the end of it, there's a song that the very last part of the study uh, hints at without saying it directly. It's a song from the old hymn book. It's called, Lord, I Hear of Showers of Blessing. And if we get there at the end, then I'll pull the song out and we might not sing it, but we'll read the words because they're so appropriate to the way that uh, study closes itself today. So welcome each one. Let us bow our heads as we pray. <clears throat> our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the invitation you've given to us that we stay close to your word because in your word we find you and the power that you have to give to each one of us. Lord, open our minds this afternoon that this information that we are about to study and for some of us review that it will filter into our minds, Lord, and into our hearts, that we will be drawn by it, and that we will, as the definition of faith says, that we will submit and yield and place our affections completely upon you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're just going to start right at the top of page 229. In our big book. And I don't know what is in the little one. And it's chapter nine in the little book. I believe that's what Austin said. <clears throat> and we're beginning by referencing the blessing of Abraham. What is the blessing of Abraham? Anyone? Oh, everybody. They can, they can okay. talk. <laughs> <laughs> the blessing of Abraham is actually righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. And faith, as I reference in my prayer, genuine faith, in fact, if we would just skip over to page, which we will come to, skip over to page 235, and we'll come back to that, of course, as we progress. It says genuine faith at the very top of, of the page, first chapter. First paragraph. First paragraph is on what is genuine faith? We've review this before two or three times in our progression in our study it says it is submission of the will to him a yielding of the heart to him and a fixing of the affections upon him amen that is what he means here to those who will receive him because believing is receiving when God speaks. So that's genuine faith. And let's not forget that. Let's remember that. So faith is not feelings. And a, mess, a point was made on that last time in your last study. So I'm going to begin by reading the very first two paragraphs. And those of you who would like to read, you will just indicate that to me or I will call on you. And, if you and can, then yeah. we'll, yeah. we'll take a paragraph or two and proceed through and maybe we'll get through the, to the end of it today. So at the top, our study last night or last time was in order to know for ourselves and how we may know, how we may know that we have the blessing of Abraham. And what is the blessing of Abraham? Righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith. <clears throat> and thus be prepared to be sure that with confidence we may ask for the spirit of God. So it's been identified before, and now it's implied here that unless we have the blessing of Abraham, we are really not prepared to ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There is more of that yet. The Lord has given us yet further evidence, yet further proof upon which to base our perfect confidence in him, in his righteousness, that that is our own, that we have the righteousness which is by faith. 
so that we can ask in perfect confidence for his Holy Spirit and thank the Lord that it is our own. For remember, the verse reads, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham, righteousness by faith, might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Amen. So how vital is righteousness by faith? It is the preparation that we must have in order to have the confidence that we can come to God and ask him to pour out the latter rain upon us individually as well as a church. Paragraph two. The blessing of Abraham is the righteousness of faith that we are to have in order to receive and that we may have the promise of the Spirit, and that also through faith. We can't emphasize that, that chronology enough. Well then, when we have the evidence, the proof, the perfect work of God, demonstrating to our complete satisfaction that we can ask in perfect confidence for the Holy Spirit, then is it not ours to receive that by faith? Amen. And remember what faith is. Okay, It's a submission. It's a yielding. Mm. And it's a setting the affection upon Christ. Is it not ours to thank God that that is our own? And that it simply remains for him to manifest it at his own will whenever occasion may require and as occasion may need. So once that preparation is happening in our lives, we have the confidence and the right to ask for the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'm going to have Mahan read here okay. paragraphs three and four. <clears throat> okay, paragraphs three and four, beginning with, well, let us study. Well, let us study then some other evidence that he has given us. Study this right now in connection with what we had last time, so that we may have before us fresh what the Lord himself has opened for us, upon which to base our confidence before him, upon which we may be sure where we stand, and upon which we may ask with the full assurance of faith. And when we ask according to his will, and ask that we may have that which he has promised, then he heareth us. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. And this comes from 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. And then we can thank him that that is our own. Let us begin with the fifth chapter of Romans, verse 20. <clears throat> the real point, or we might say one of the main points of the study today, is to see what place the law of God occupies in the subject of righteousness by faith. What place the law of God occupies in our obtaining the righteousness alone by Jesus Christ. And this is simply another phase of the same thought that we had last time as to what proof the Lord has given us to give us confidence that we can claim by faith the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's see. Um, let's go to Ashton. Okay. Okay, Ashton. Hello. Go ahead. Read the next three paragraphs, Ashton. Okay. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. In other words, Romans 3.20, the last words, words which, with which you are familiar, by the law is the knowledge of sin. What was the law given for on tables of stone, the first purpose of its giving? To show us what sin is. To make sin abound, to give knowledge of sin. So the law entered that the offense might abound, that sin might appear, that it might appear as it is. Paul, speaking in the 7th chapter of Romans, says how it appeared to him in 12th and 13th verses. Before you go on, Ashton, let's 
highlight that there. Because many times when we read that the law came in, came in so that sin could abound, we would hear, we would think in our minds, why would God, God do that to us? He gives us the law so that we can have more sin? No, so that we could have knowledge of the sin that is in us and we could see the need that we have for him. Okay, continue Ashton. All right. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by, by that by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Then to make sin abound and make it appear as it is, exceedingly sinful, that is the first ob object of the giving of the law, isn't it? Amen. Now let us read right on Roman, right on in Romans 5. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. Then did the law come alone, making sin to appear alone and that alone? No. no. It is simply the means to another end, the means to an end by which to attain another object beyond the knowledge of sin. Is that so? Yes. Yes. So then where sin abounds, where is it that grace abounds? In, In the same place. Place. Right there? Yes. Yeah. But does it read that way? Where sin abounded, grace abounded. No, no, much more. That would be pretty good, wouldn't it? If it was only where sin abounds, that there grace abounds. That would be pretty good. But that is not the way the Lord does things, you know. He does things in absolutely well, entirely good, just as good as God could do. Amen. Amen. And we could stop all through the reading so far and make comments, but I'm hoping that we all are uh, grasping because we have grasped it before. So let's move on. One. Eddie, Eddie, can you read the next one, two, three, four paragraphs? <laughs> sure. A quick Hi, comment. Eddie. Hi, Eddie. Uh-oh. Oh, okay. Tim. Hello. Howdy. Hey. I was just thinking just in the context of where it's saying that uh, – that sin abounds. And I just ponder in this existence that we're living, in this world that we're living, um, you're, you're kind of wondering, why would the Lord let uh, Satan have all of the uh, access that he's getting right now to us, to this environment we're in? And I'm just pondering that it, it, the, the significance of that is is that when you get to see where this is going, when you can see the actions unfolding, um, this is really giving us some clarity of what we're what we're contending with. It's very real. It's it it it, it seems to really have no limit. When when sin is let loose, what kinds of things does that uh, unfold in front of you? And then you know the lord goes okay you get to see that you get to see this now then i'm going to show you something there's going to be a response to that Grace but, but boy oh boy are we seeing some horrible things though as this is unfolding to see where this is headed yeah on the cosmic level of course you know Great controversy around, but individually the call of this text is for us to see ourselves as wretched. You know, the Apostle Paul says he was of all men most miserable. Hmm. Because unless chief we see sinners. ourselves as the chief of sinners, we really are not going to appreciate grace. Mm -hmm. Amen. Not until God lays our glory in the dust mm -hmm. do we really appreciate the grace that abounds. Okay, back to you, Eddie. Thanks. Well, then, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. Then, brethren, when the Lord, by his law, has given us the knowledge of sin, just at that very moment, at that very point, grace is much more abundant than the knowledge of sin. Is that so? Yes. Amen. Amen. Now, another word. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And we have found this much that when the law gives the knowledge of sin at that particular moment in that very place and at that very point in that very thing the grace of god is much more abundant 
than the knowledge of sin. Amen. But when much we all need to remember that and encourage people with that. Yeah. But when the law gives the knowledge of sin, what puts the conviction there? The Spirit, Spirit of God. God. Before we read the passage, which says so, however, let us see what we are to get so far from what we have read. What are you and I henceforth to get from the knowledge of sin? Abundance, Abundance of grace. grace. Then there is no possible place for discouragement at the sight of sins anymore, is there? No. No, no possibility of that. It is impossible, you see, for you or me to get discouraged or under a cloud anymore at the knowledge of sin. Because no difference how great the knowledge is, no difference how many sins are revealed to us and brought to our knowledge. Why, right there, at the very moment, at that very moment, in those very things, and at that very time in our experience, the grace of God much more abounds than all the knowledge of sins. Amen. Well then, I say again, how is it possible for us ever to be discouraged? Brethren, isn't it so that the Lord wants us to be of good cheer? Amen. Be of good cheer. Amen. Yes. You see, um, the devil is good at reminding us of our sins, right? He's good at bringing up our sins. Our guilt. Yeah. And he has one purpose, and that is to discourage us. So if our lives are not submitted to God as what faith is described as, if we are not yielding to God, if our affections are not set upon Christ, what's going to happen to us when Satan comes around and throws up our sins in our faces? Discouraged. We'll get discouraged. Mm -hmm. But the antidote to discouragement is genuine faith. Grace. Yes, indeed. It seems this is breaking down the, the word trust mm -hmm. when you're uh, trying to figure out what it is that we're uh, doing in regard to trusting the Lord. And it just reminds me of in the Garden of Eden, um, when the fall occurred, Adam and Eve clothed themselves, then they hid themselves. Mm -hmm. And here God comes in and he calls. Of course, he knew where Adam and Eve uh, was. But he says, still, he says, where are you? And the trust now is gone the, that they had. There, there is a separation. And there the devil uh, lies. He waits and he takes that separation and uses it to say, well, this is the kind of God we're talking about here. One we're afraid of, one that's going to do something to us. And that's... Uh, that's the unfortunate part of uh, the lie that's being told. And it's precisely the opposite of faith. Amen. Exactly. Okay. Okay, let's move on to Corley. We'll do one, two paragraphs, please. Well, now, this verse that we have before us brings the same thing to view. John 16, 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. What is he telling us? The truth. truth. Good. And he told us also that ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That is it then, isn't it? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. Who will not come? The, the comforter. comforter. Who? The comforter. the comforter. The comforter? Is that his name? Is that what he is, the comforter? Yes. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, who has come? The comforter. The comforter. Who? The comforter. And when he is come, he will reprove or convince the world of sin. Who is it that does it? The comforter. The comforter. Is it the comforter that convinces of sin? Yes. yes. Is he the comforter when he does it? Yes. yes. Now each one of each one wants to get hold of that. Is not he the reprover when he does it and the comforter some other time? No. It is the comforter that reproves. Thank the Lord. The comforter reproves. Thank the Lord. Then what are we to get out of the reproof of sin? Comfort. comfort. Whose comfort? 
Lord's, the Lord's comfort. comfort. The comfort we get comforts just at the time when it is needed. Mm -hmm. Then where is the room for our getting discouraged anymore at the knowledge of sin? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the very thought that we have read in the fifth chapter of Romans? Okay, let's move to Dagmar. Dagmar? Are you available, Dagmar? I am. I had to scramble to unmute myself. Okay, yes. Of course. Okay. How many? Don't you see then? How many? Hold on a Dagmar, second. Dagmar. Let's get you over to one, two, let's give you three paragraphs. Three paragraphs. Okay. One, two. Don't you see then? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Don't you see then that when we bear in mind just at the moment and at the time and at the place that where sin abounds, their grace much more abounds. And just at the same time when the Holy Spirit is giving conviction of sin, he is the comforter that does it. Amen. Don't you see that in all that, remembering all that, we have an everlasting victory over Satan? Amen. Does Satan get the advantage of that man who believes God right then? No. Satan comes and says, see what a sinner you are. Thank the Lord. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen. Amen. Well, says another, I have such a deep conviction of sin. It seems to me I was never convicted of sin so deeply before in all my life. Thank the Lord. We have got more comfort than ever before in our lives. Don't you see, brethren, that that is so? It is, it is so. so. Well, then, let us thank the Lord for that. Amen. I should like to know why we should not praise the Lord right along. I want to just throw out a little, um, a little uh, suggestion here that what we just read about the Holy Spirit pointing out our sin and comforting us, what a model for parenting, right? When our children make, make mistakes and when they need to be disciplined, yet if we do it after the model of the Holy Spirit, then yes, their shortcomings are pointed out, but what is it? pointed out in the context of um, comfort, not punishment. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, continue on, please. Okay. But there is some more in that Roman 520. What is this all for? First, we found that the law makes sin abound in order that grace may abound, so that we may have the grace to lead us to Christ. Now, what are the two things together for? The law making sin abound in order that more grace may abound. What are they both together for? That as sin hath reigned unto death. We know that so, don't we? Now that is so. The law makes sin abound, that we may be, be led to more abundance of grace in order that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign. Amen. Amen. One more? Or... Okay, one more. Okay. What does even so mean? Just as certainly, just so. Then isn't it so that God will make that abundance of grace to reign in our lives just as certainly as ever sin did in the world? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but mark you, when the grace much more abundant bountifully reigns, then what is the comparison between freedom from sin now and the slavery to it before? The freedom is much more abundant even than the slavery was. Amen. Can we yeah. read that together? And I know we're, we, we're not going to be able to hear all of us because we are all muted, but let's read that sentence together. The freedom, freedom is, is much more much abundant, more abundant even, even than the slavery, slavery was. Go ahead. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, who comes next? Uh, how about Karen next to her? Can Karen, okay. can you read? She's coming. Can you read through to the bottom of that page? Now let us see the whole story. 
the law entered that the offense might abound in order that we might find the more abundant grace abounding right there in all those places and the grace abounds through righteousness unto eternal life by Christ Jesus our Lord. Then what did the law enter for? To bring, to bring us, us to, the to the Lord. What did the law enter for? To bring, to bring us to Christ. Christ. Yes, don't you see? Then whenever anybody in this world uses the Ten Commandments, when any sinner in this world uses the Ten Commandments for any other purpose than to reach Jesus Christ, what kind of a purpose is he putting them to? A wrong, a wrong purpose. purpose. He is perverting the intent of God in giving the law, isn't he? Yes, yes. ma'am. Now let's read together the next sentence too, because that summarizes what she just read let's read together to, to use, use the, the law of god, god with men, men for any other purpose therefore and that they may reach christ jesus is to use, to use the law in a way that god never intended to be used Amen. It's not a hammer to hit people over the head with. And it's not either the, the way to come to people and say, hey, I want you to know about this and show them the law first. No, show Christ first. Because it will be, uh, I've given this um, illustration before. I will do, do so quickly. If you as a, as a man, as a gentleman, approach a woman on a hallway or on the street and say, hey, would you like to do my clothes and do my cooking and have my children and raise my children? Would you please? They will run away. But if the woman falls in love with you, not the law, but you, Christ, if we fall in love with Christ, then the woman ends up doing what? Doing the cooking, doing the clothing, ra raising the children, training the children, all of that. But because of love, she is in love. And that's the difference between the law and bringing people to Christ. And then they find out about the law. Okay, continue, Karen. Well, the law then brings us to Christ. That's certain. What for? That we may be justified. justified. What does the law want of you and me? Does it make any demands of us before we reach Jesus Christ? When the law finds us, does it want anything from us? It, it wants righteousness. Mm -hmm. What kind? Perfect, Perfect righteousness. righteousness. Whose? God's. God's righteousness? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just such righteousness alone as God manifests in his own life, in his own way of doing things? Yeah. Yes. Will that law be content with anything less than that from you and me? Will it accept anything less than that, a hair's breadth less no if we could come within a hair's breadth of it that's too far short we miss it turn to timothy and paul tells us what the law wants out of you and me and what it wants in us too first timothy 1 5 now the end the object the aim the intent the purpose of the commandment is charity what charity love love what kind of love? The love, the love of, of God. God. Out of a pure heart. What kind of a heart? A pure heart. Your heart. And of a good conscience. What kind of a conscience? Good. good. And of faith unfeigned. That is what the law wants to find in you and me, isn't it? Will it accept you and me with anything less than that which it <laughs> demands? Perfect love manifested. Out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and a faith unfeigned? No, never. Well, that is simply perfection that it demands. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, let's continue. Uh, Margaret, let's keep building the momentum here because it's really driving home. It's a wonderful gospel. Margaret, Margaret. unmute just There you go. I did. And? Well, now, have we? Two has paragraphs, any... Margaret. Okay, Margaret, two paragraphs. Okay. Well, now, have we, has any man in the world, any of that kind of love to offer to the law of God? No. Has any man naturally that kind of a conscience? No. Nope. Has he that kind of faith? No. No, sir. Well, 
Then the law makes that demand on every man on the earth tonight. No difference who he is. He makes it of you and me. He makes that demand of people in Africa and of all the people on the earth. And he will not accept anything less than that from any one of them. But we are talking about ourselves tonight. So the law comes to you and to me tonight and says, I want charity. I want perfect love, the love of God. I want to see it in your life all the time. And I want to see it manifested out of a pure heart and through a good conscience and unfeigned faith. That is where we are. Well, says one, I have not got it. I have done my best. But the law will say that is not what I want. I don't want your best. I want perfection. It is not your doing I want anyhow. It is God's. God's that I want. It is not your righteousness I am after. I want God's righteousness from you. It is not your doing I want. I want God's doing in your life. That is what the law says to every man. Then when I am shut off, thus at the very first question, and even then when I said I did my best, then I have nothing more to say. Is that not what the scripture says, that every mouth may be stopped? It does just that. Does it not? And by the way, there's a quotation from Romans 3.19, that every mouth may be stopped or shut up. Shut up. Yes. Okay, Mark, can you read? Yes. And we'll take you to three paragraphs. But there comes still a small voice saying, here is perfect love. Here is life. life. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Here is perfect life. Here is the life of God. He is a pure heart. He is a good conscience. He is unfeigned faith. Where does the voice come from? Christ. Christ. Oh, the, lo the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and stood where I stand in the flesh in which I live. He lived there. The perfect love of God was manifested there. The perfect purity of heart manifested there. A good conscience manifested there. The unseen faith of the mind that was in Jesus Christ is there. Mm -hmm. Well then, he simply comes and tells me, here, take this. That will satisfy. Then, will it? Yeah. The life manifested in Jesus Christ, that will satisfy the law. The purity of heart that Jesus Christ gives, that will satisfy the law. The good conscience that he can create, that will satisfy. The unfeigned faith which he gives, that will satisfy. Will it? Yes. 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 Well then, is that Mark, not what? Okay. Pause. Mark, we're going to move on to Shandi and give Shandi Please. where we... <clears throat> one... Two, three, four little ones there, Shandi. Alrighty. Okay, and she's on mute, so go on. Well then, is that not what the law wants all the time? It is Jesus Christ that the law wants, is it not? Yes. yes. That is what the law wants. That is the same thing which it calls for in the fifth of Romans, is it not? But why does it call for it in connection with me? It calls for Christ in me because the law wants to see that thing in me. Then is not the object of the law of God, the gospel of Christ alone? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Ah, that is so. Amen. Amen. That is so beautiful. Continue. One, five. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And that is charity, supreme love. Acts 15, 8 and 9. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. There is the love of God out of a pure heart. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, 
who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. There is a clean conscience, brethren, and there is the love of God out of a good conscience. Mm -hmm. One more. Then that faith which he gives, which he enables us to keep, the faith of Jesus, which enables us to keep the commandments of God, there is the love of God by a faith unfeigned. Amen. 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 Let's continue on. Sylvia, can you read uh, to the bottom of that page from O oh, Then? O oh, Then, the message of the righteousness of God, which is by the faith in Jesus Christ, brings us to and brings to us the perfect fulfillment of the law of God, does it not? Yes. yes. Then that is the object and the aim and the one single point of the third angel's message, is it not? Yes. yes. That is Christ. Um, that is Christ. Christ in his righteousness, Christ in his purity, Christ in his love, Christ in his gentleness, Christ in his entire being, Christ in him crucified. That is the word, brethren. Let us be glad of it. Let us be glad of it. Amen. Amen. So <laughs> then, when we have Jesus, when we have received him by faith, and the law stands before us, or we stand before it, and it makes it wondrous demand of charity, we can say, here it is. It is in Christ, and he is mine. Amen. Out of a pure heart, here it is in Christ, and he has given it to me, a good conscience. The blood of Christ has created it in me. Here it is, faith on faith, the faith in Jesus. He has given it to me. Here it is. Then just as steps to Christ tells us, we can come to Jesus now and be cleansed and stand before the law without one touch of shame or remorse. Amen. Good brethren, when I have that, which makes me at perfect agreement with the law of God, then I am satisfied. I cannot help but be glad that I am satisfied. Amen. Amen. Now let us turn and read the third chapter of Romans that tells the whole story without any further study than simply to read the text, Romans uh, chapter 3, verses 19 to 22. We can say amen to every word of it now, right straight along. Now we know, and that is so, that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And is it not that? That which tells me that I am a sinner could not tell me that I am righteous. But now good. When? Now. All right. Let us say so, brethren. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. That is so, is it not? Yes. yes. The law cannot manifest it in us because we cannot see it there. It is there but we are so blind that we cannot see it there. Uh, sin has so blinded and corrupted us that we cannot see it in the law. And if we could see it there, we could not get it there because there is not anything in us to start with that is fit for it. We are utterly helpless. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marlies, can you pick up from there and do two paragraphs, please? So now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. What does that word believe mean when God speaks it? Faith. 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 And what is genuine faith? Submission of the will let's to read, him. Let's read that all together if we can. Submission, Submission of, of the will, will to him, him. A yielding of the heart to him. A fixing of the affections upon him. That is what he means here to those who will receive him. Because believing is receiving when God speaks. 
let's try to memorize the first part of the, those three points that describe genuine faith. But anyway, continue on, please, uh, Marlies. He says so in the first chapter of John, 12th verse. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Then we can everyone here have it tonight? Can have it? Have it because we believe it. Yeah, Amen. Well, now, that, keep going? Yes. Well, now, that is the object of the law, then, is it not? To bring us to Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith, made righteous by faith, that his righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ, may be ours? That is it. Well, when that is true, when we have God there, then what is the use of the law? Then what is the law for? It witnesses. Exactly. Let us read now that part of the 21st verse that I did not read. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law. That is as far as we need to read just now. The other belongs there, though. Then, when the law gives a knowledge of sin, in order that we may have the knowledge of the abundance of grace to take away the sin, then grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ. And this righteousness of God by faith in Christ is our own through the working of the law. And this knowledge of sin has brought us to Christ. And we have him, and the law is satisfied in all his demands that it has made upon us. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go to Marsha. And Marsha will have you do one, two, three paragraphs. Now when it is satisfied in all its demands it has made upon us, then will it, then will it stick to that and keep on saying that it is satisfied, that that is all right. That's a question, by the way. Okay, that that is all right. Will it stick to that? Will it keep on saying that it is satisfied, that that is all right? Keep on going. When the law has made demands upon us that we cannot satisfy by any other possible means except by Jesus Christ being presented in ourselves, Present. then, will the, then will the law of God, as long as we stay there, stand right there and say, that is right, and I am satisfied with it. That's a question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> then if anybody begins to question it and says, is not this so? Then we have witness to prove it. Have we? Mm -hmm. Now you see this. That is necessary for several reasons that we should have witnesses. One in our own connection and in our own personal experience is this. When God speaks and we believe it, then we know each one for himself that the righteousness of God is our own that we are entitled to it, that it belongs to us, and that we can rest in perfect peace upon it. But there are other people that need to know this too. Can they know it by saying so? No. No. Can they know it by saying that I assent to this and that I say that, and that I say that is so, and therefore it is so? Will it convince them? Is this the proof, this, is that proof enough for them? No. Nope. Yeah. We, we they, need something. We, they need try. something <laughs> but it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> they need something better even than my word don't you see that the lord has met that very demand and has given us witnesses to which they can appeal and they can go and ask these witnesses whenever they please whether this that we have is genuine or not is that so yes yes then they need not come and inquire of us if they inquire of us, of course, we can tell them what the Lord has told us to say. And if that is not enough, they can go and ask those witnesses. We can say, there are some friends of mine. They know me from my birth till now. They know me all the way through. They know me better than I do myself. And if you want any more than this, that I say, go and ask them. They will tell you. How many of them are there? 10. Ten. Is their word worth anything? Do they tell the truth? Ah, they are truth itself. They are the truth. Psalm 119, 143, 42. That, that text well, says, your righteousness is forever. Your law is true. true. Amen. 
well, then it is impossible for them to testify otherwise and bearing witness than that. When they say that that demand is satisfied, this life is well pleasing to me. That is enough for anybody in the universe, is it not? Yes. 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 Okay, let's keep on going with Tim reading two, the next two paragraphs. Okay, it begins with, so then. Yes. Mm -hmm. So then, the man who claims to believe in Jesus and claims the righteousness of God, which comes to the believer in Jesus, is his claiming it enough for this world? No. Congregation? No. Or is our word in regard to it enough? Congregation? No. no. Well, they will say, and there are lots of them that will say it, why, yes, we believe in the Savior, and I have a right to claim, too, the righteousness that he has, the perfect holiness and perfect sanctification, and that I have not sinned for 10 years, and am about, I'm above all temptation, even, and I know it. Well, how do you know it? Why, I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my heart, and I have for several years. Well, that is no evidence at all, for the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Deceitful. Above all things? All, above how many things? All, all things. things. All things? Yes. Well, above Satan even? Yes. yes. Is the heart actually deceitful above all things? Yes. He says so, whether we can understand it or not. It is more deceitful than Satan himself, isn't it? Yes. Boy, oh boy. The heart will deceive me quicker and oftener than Satan will. Wow. My. Well then, when that person feels it in his heart, is that a good kind of evidence? Yeah. When my heart says that I am good, then what is it doing, congregation? It's deceiving. It is deceiving. Solomon said, he that trusteth his own heart is a fool. And he is not only a fool, but he is fooled in this thing. Is he not? Yes. Yeah. And he is not only a fool, but he is a fooled. But he is fooled in this. Okay, I'm <laughs> sorry. It is bad enough for a wise man to be fooled. But when a fool is fooled, what is the world? What in the world is the thing coming to? Therefore, we cannot afford to trust such things as that on such an important question as this. No, sir. We need better evidence than a man's heart that he has got the righteousness of God and that he is all right and is fit for the judgment and that he has not sinned for 10 years, holy and sanctified and above temptation, etc., etc. We need something better than that. And the fact of the matter is Jesus was here in this world a good while and he never was above temptations while he was here. Christians are not either. Uh, while they live. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's an individual called Sandy. Hawthorne. Are you able to read? Well, then, that evidence is not enough. We want something more than that. And if that person who claims to have the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ has only that for a witness and has testimony can go only that far, then what is his claim worth? Nothing, nothing at all. all. Nothing at all. Just nothing at all. It is a deceptive claim. He never can realize upon it. So the Lord has not left us there. Last night, we found in our lesson that when we want to know that these things are so in our experience, we are not to look within to find out whether it is so, but to look at what God says to see whether it is so. Amen. When we, um, amen. When we have found Jesus Christ, 
and have him, then the Lord does not want us to look within to see whether he is there. He has furnished us witnesses whose testimony will tell us all the time that he is there. And these will tell everybody else that he is there. The righteousness of God is now manifested, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. And when it is, it is witnessed by the law. Amen. Sandy, thank you so much for your powerful reading. Amen. Would you be willing to do another paragraph right now? Oh, sure. Okay, let's do that. Then the law is first. Sure. That's about the two purposes of the law. Then the law is first to bring us onto Christ. And after it has led us to Christ and we have found him, then it witnesses that that is just the thing. First, we have first to give the knowledge of sin. And second, to witness to the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Can I read that again? Yes. Okay, first to give the knowledge of sin, and second, to witness to the righteousness of God, which is by faith. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well then, anybody who uses the law of God for any other purpose than these two purposes at any time, what is he doing with the law of God? Perverting it. Perverting it. He's perverting the whole thing. He is using it for purposes that God never intended at all. So then, though a man or an angel use the law of God in any other way or for any other purpose than those two things, a man can use it for both, but angels can use it for one. He has perverted the law of God. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to go to Benny. And Benny will give you two paragraphs. Where is our righteousness from? God. Their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the lights of the knowledge of the, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Where do we find the knowledge of the glory of God? In the face of, of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. In the face of Jesus Christ. Now, 2 Corinthians uh, third chapter, verse 18 says, But we all, with open face beholden as in the glass of the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, then what it is it that we see in the face of Jesus Christ? The glory, glory of the Lord. Lord. What is the glory of the Lord? We have read here, we have been told here by the Spirit of God that the message of the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, that is the beginning of glory, of the glory that the that is to lighten the whole earth, then what is the glory of God? His righteousness, his character, mm -hmm. where do we find it? In mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. There is the glory of God revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. He said so. Do we look to the law of righteousness? No. no. Even after we have been brought to Christ, do we look there for righteousness? No. no. Where do we look for righteousness? In the face of Jesus Christ, there we all, with open face beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, from righteousness to righteousness, from character to character, mm -hmm. from goodness to goodness, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Talk about sanctification, huh? Yes. Complete transformation. Holding the face of Jesus. Go ahead. So that's the part of the definition of faith. Keep going, please. Then don't you see? Then don't you see how the righteousness of God and the Holy Spirit go hand in hand? Yes. Don't you see 
that when we obtain the righteousness, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, the blessing of Abraham indeed, then that then the Holy Spirit cannot be kept away from us. You cannot separate the two. They belong together. Then we have that and know that we have that. Then when we have faith, that. Well, but you're in a different book, right, Janet? Yeah. You're in the little book? Yeah. They belong together then when we have that and now and know that we have that by the faith in his word. Then he says we have a right to ask for the Holy Spirit and to receive it too. Mm -hmm. Now let's, let's, let us remember how anxious God is to give us the Holy Spirit so we don't even have to beg for it. Because remember that both of those things go together. Okay, one more paragraph, please. Why? Look at it in Galatians chapter 4, verse 5. He came to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into the hearts. He sends, he sends it. He does not want to hold it back. He sends it to, into the heart. It is a free gift. Amen. Then I say, don't you see that it is impossible to keep the righteousness of God and the Holy Spirit separated? So then, when we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, and when the image of God in Jesus Christ is found in us, what then? There is an impress. The seal of God. There is the impress. The seal of God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. you have heard that in other lessons. The rest of this paragraph says, "Do you have that or not?" No, she has in separate paragraphs, honey. Okay. So small book. All right. Let me read that. Let me finish up this paragraph. When, by looking into the face of Jesus Christ, and there alone, having received the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Him, and looking ever into His glorious face. That reflects the glory of God. The effect of that is to change us into the same image, to perfect the image of God and restore it in us by the working of the Spirit of God upon the soul. And when that is done, then the same Spirit of God is there to affix the seal of the living God, the eternal impress of his own image. Austin, can you pick up from there and read two paragraphs, please? So then, after we have come to Christ, after we have found him, then we do not look into the law for righteousness. Where do we look? In the face, face of, of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Into the face of Jesus Christ. And while we look there, what does the law say? That's that right. is right. The law testifies, that is the place to look. That is what I want you to have. That is satisfactory. We are perfectly agreed. Where in heaven do the angels look? Don't they look into the law to see whether they are right or not? Always beholding the face of our Father. Their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Then where does the righteousness of the angels come from? God. From God. From God, through Jesus Christ, is it not? Mm -hmm. And what does the law in the throne of God, the foundation of his throne, what does the original copy of his law do there? When the angels look into the face of him who sits upon the throne... What does the law that never was touched by man and never could be, what does it do there? It witnesses to the righteousness of God, which they obtain without the law. Amen. Okay. This, I think you're on the momentum there, Austin. You read another paragraph. This was always the true idea of the uses of the law of God. When the people had sinned and done anything against the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and were guilty, then they were to bring the sacrifice and they were forgiven. And then as now, the commandments witness to the righteousness which they obtained by faith in Jesus. And therefore the tabernacle was called the tabernacle of witness. The tabernacle of the testimony is the same thing because testimony is the evidence given by a witness. So then, the tabernacle was the tabernacle of witness or testimony. The ark was the ark of the testimony or witness because it contained the tables of the testimony. The tables of stone, the tables of the law, were the tables of the testimony because they were the evidence of the witness which God appointed to witness to the righteousness of God, which comes without the law by faith of Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Then it is everlastingly true 
throughout the universe that if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Mm -hmm. Forever and everywhere, it is true that their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Yeah. And the law witnesses to the righteousness which all obtain from God without the law, but by Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, Jan, we'd like for you to read one to three paragraphs, please. Then isn't it true, as I said a while ago, that whether man or angel, if he uses the law of God for any other than one, or both of these two purposes, he perverts the law of God entirely from what God ever intended. Well then, the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, that satisfies everything, does it not? Everything now, and how long? Forever. Forever. Now and evermore, it satisfies everything. Well then, we may know for our own selves that it is ours by the evidences that God gave us last night, the last time, and they are everlastingly sure. And everybody in this world may know that we are entitled to it by the witnesses that God has given. Well, this is to fit us for the seal of God, the righteousness of God, in order that through this we may be changed from glory to glory into the same image. And when that is completed, what then? What witnesses to that? The Sabbath of the Lord. It will witness to that finished, completed work all the way through. As Professor Prescott gave us in his sermon, it is the presence of Christ that makes holy and sanctifies the place where it is. Amen. And when the presence of Christ is there in its fullness, then what is that place? That is sanctified. What is the sign of sanctification? Sabbath. The Sabbath. And sanctification complete is God's complete work in the soul. Then when the work of God is completed in the soul, the law of God will witness to it all the way. But what particular part of the law of God is a witness to that particular thing? The complete sanctification of his people. The Sabbath, Sabbath of, of the, the Lord. Lord. It stands there as the witness and as the chief witness and the two coming together testify and the seal is fixed. That work is completed. Okay. Chris, are you able to read? Hello. Brethren, how can we get away from the seal of God? Then are we not right now in the time of the sealing? Yes. yes. And it is through the witness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, is it not? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. And then when that seal is received, when that is affixed there, then these can stand through the time of the plagues, through all the temptations and the trials of Satan, when he works with all power and signs and lying wonders. For the promise is, as thou kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Revelation 3.10. Continue, please. And when that is passed, then entrance into the heavenly city, entrance into that heavenly city. Thank the Lord. There are tests that we are to pass through. But brethren, when we have this righteousness of Jesus Christ, we have that which will pass through every test. Amen. And in that day, there are going to be two parties there. There are going to be some there when the door is shut and they will want to go in and say, Lord, open to us. We want to come in. And someone comes and asks, what have you done that you should come in? What right have you to enter the inheritance here? What claim have you upon that? Oh, we are acquainted with you, and we have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Yes, besides that, we have prophesied in thy name, and in thy name we have cast out devils, and in thy name we have done many wonderful works. Why do we have, why we have done many wonderful things? Lord, is not that evidence enough? Open the door. One more problem. What is the answer? Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why did they, what did they say? We have done many wonderful works. We have done them. We are all right. We are righteous. We are just, exactly right. Therefore, we have a right to be there. Open the door. But we does not count there, does it? Okay. And Rose is going to continue on from there. There is going to be another company there that day. A great multitude that no man can number. 
all nations and kindreds and tongues and people, and they will come up to enter in. And if anyone should ask them that question, what have you done that you should enter here? What claim have you here? The answer will be, oh, I have not done anything at all to deserve it. I am a sinner, dependent only on the grace of the Lord. Oh, I was so wretched, so completely a captive, and in such a bondage that nobody could deliver me but the Lord himself. So miserable that all I could ever do was to have the Lord constantly to comfort me. So poor that I had constantly to beg from the Lord. So blind that no one but the Lord could cause me to see. So naked that no one could clothe me but the Lord himself. All the claim that I have is what Jesus has done for me. But the Lord has loved me. When I'm in my wretchedness, wretchedness, I cried, he delivered me. When in my misery, I wanted comfort, he comforted me all the way. When in my poverty, I begged, he gave me riches. When in my blindness, I asked him to show me the way that I might know the way, he led me all the way and made me to see. When I was so naked that no one could clothe me, why, he gave me this garment that I have on. And so all I can present, all that I have to present as that upon which I can enter, any claim that would cause me to enter is just what he has done for me. If that will not pass me, then I am left out. And that will be just too. If I am left out, I have no complaint to make. But oh, will not this entitle me to enter and possess the inheritance? Beautiful. But he says, well, there are some very particular persons here. They want to be fully satisfied with everybody that goes by here. We have 10 examiners here. When they look into a man's case and say that he is all right, when they, why then he can pass? Are you willing that these shall be called to examine into your case? And we shall answer, yes, yes, because I want to enter in and I am willing to submit to any examination because even if I am left out, I have no complaint to make. I am lost anyway when I am left to myself. Mom? Uh, yes, sweetheart. Before you go on, uh, we've got a raised hand from Ben Cowenberg family. Oh, okay. Um, Letitia? How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll tell you where to pick up, okay? But oh, I, no, no, no. Oh. Sorry, I just wanted to comment really quick before you continue. Oh, I'll comment. On. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so this whole experience that we're reading about is so powerful. It is so real. It's not, um, it's not something that is far fetched. It's very real. When we see our wretchedness and we see who we are right now, it reminds me of what Peter went through and how Jesus had, um, um, told him that he was praying for him, that his faith would not fail when we know that it wasn't Peter's faith. It was Christ's faith, right? And so Peter fell because of his self-sufficiency. He fell because he was relying um, solely on his own power instead of relying upon the power that can actually help him to be able to get through whatever trial. So Amen. I just had to add that because it was just, uh, as you're reading, I thought, yes, you're right. This is not us. This is God. This is God working through us, depending upon him. Mark in your books this uh, illustration here because that is exactly the way that we are qualified to enter and when we put it in a conversation like that you know the, the dialogue as people approach you know the entrance to heaven uh, how are we gonna be what are we gonna be counting on so let wanna, me go ahead finish no I was gonna and I want to add to that not just mark it but read it but review it often yes because this is the heavenly reality that, you know, that we are going to be up against in the very end of time. We are. Mm -hmm. Well, says he, we will call them then. So he's calling now the 10 witnesses. And so those 10 are brought up and they say, why, yes, we are perfectly satisfied with him. Why, yes, the deliverance that he obtained from his wretchedness is that which our Lord wrought. The comfort that he had all the way 
and that he needed so much is that which our Lord gave, the wealth that he had, whatever he has, poor as he was, the Lord gave it. And blind, whatever he sees, it is the Lord that gave it to him. And he sees it only, he sees only what is the Lord's. And naked as he was, the garment that he had on, the Lord gave it to him. The Lord wove it, and it is all divine. It is only Christ. Why, yes, he can come in. And here, when, when the sermon was being given, it has there in, in uh, brackets what happened. People started to sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin has left. He washed it white as snow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Continuing. And then, brethren, there will come over the gates a voice of sweetest music, full of the gentleness and compassion of my Savior. The voice will come from within. Come in, thou blessed of the Lord. Amen. Why standest thou without? And the Lord will be, and the gate will be swung wide open, and we shall have an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you just imagine that right now? Oh, he is a complete Savior. Amen. He is my Savior. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My soul shall rejoice in the Lord, brethren, tonight. Oh, I say with David, come and magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. He has made complete satisfaction. There is not, not anything against us, brethren. The way is clear. The road is open. The righteousness of Christ satisfies. That is light and love and joy and eternal excellence. Isn't it true then of Isaiah 60 verse 1? Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Brethren, he can do it. He wants to do it. Let us, let him do it. Amen. And let us praise him while he is doing it. Now can't we praise the Lord? Then everybody in this house that wants to do it, you just go ahead Go right ahead now. I will say amen to every word of it, for my soul magnifies him too, brethren. My soul praises him too, brethren, because he is my savior. He has completed the work. He has done his gracious work. He has saved me. He saves all. Let us thank him forevermore. Amen. And then Professor Prescott, said the times of refreshing are here brethren the spirit of god is here open the heart open the heart open the heart in praise and thanksgiving amen i can amen. just imagine the atmosphere at the end of that meeting the same as ours and before we tackle any scheduling issues let me read the words of this hymn, this old hymn that is not in our new hymn book. It's number 208 in the old. It's called, Lord, I Hear of Showers of Blessing. Lord, I hear of showers of blessing. Thou art scattering full and free. Showers the thirsty soul refreshing. Let some drops now fall on me. Pass me not, O gracious Father, Sinful though my heart may be, thou mightst leave me, but the rather let thy mercy rest on me. Have I long in sin been sleeping, long been sliding, grieving thee? 
has the world and my heart been keeping? Oh, forgive and rescue me. Pass me not, O oh Holy Spirit. Thou canst make the blind to see. Testify of Jesus' merit. Speak the word of peace to me. And the refrain says, even me, even me, let some drops now fall on me. So as we close, let's do that in prayer, and then we will have some announcements. And so I want to encourage you to take this chapter again. You know, that we have completed it doesn't mean that it's okay to set it aside, but to come back to it, the contents of it is the preparation that we all need for the latter rain to fall upon us individually and upon our church Amen. at large. Amen. So let us bow our heads as we close in prayer. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of study on this very quiet Sabbath afternoon. We thank you, Lord, for revealing again, again to us our wretchedness. But we thank you that you have not left us there, Lord, that you made plans for our salvation from the foundation of the world to send your Son, your beloved Son, to come and stand in our place in this world and meet the assaults of the enemy, and by dependence upon you, his heavenly Father, he was able to say no to all the temptations that were hurled on him. And Lord, when in Gethsemane, he was tempted to walk away from, Cal from Calvary, he remained in submission to you. He remained yielding himself completely to you, and he remained with his face, his affection set completely on you. Amen. Lord, I pray for that definition of faith to be the reality of each one of our experiences, Lord, each day. We will surrender and submit to you, your love that draws us to you so that if we are not drawn, we would have to resist, resist your drawing. That we will yield, we will say, Lord, invade every single part of our beings and not stand in the way. And then, Lord, we will continuously day by day, like Enoch did, to walk with you, to look at your beautiful face, to find our identity only in you and to watch you transform us through the power of your Holy Spirit. That people will see from not what we say, but from how we live our lives, from how we interact with them, that indeed the Holy Spirit indwells us. Mm -hmm. Lord, we know that that's the experience that we must have in order to be sealed, that in order for your latter rain power to be poured out upon us and for the, for the loud cry message to be given. We want to be part of that, Lord. And so I pray that as we study and fellowship and share with one another, that we will keep on encouraging one another even as the day is fast approaching. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Okay. Austin has announcements. There he is. All right. So um, announcements are that the next meeting is going to be November 21st, third Sabbath of November. That's the weekend prior to Thanksgiving at 2 p.m. And we will be uh, going through the next chapter, which is in the large book, chapter 19, and in the small book, chapter 10. And you'll use the same links that you used for today to access via Zoom or via the uh, web phone. Uh, this meeting, as, as the previous ones, are recorded and kept on my YouTube channel. And there's a quick link that you can access it through there. And then you can always reach me by email if you have a question, if you want to get onto the group email list, uh, if you need copies of the books. And let me show you how to get copies of the books while we're at it. So we now pretty much have PDFs available for all the books. You hear us referring to the large book. That's the Third Angel's Message, 1893 Sermons by A.T. Jones. And you can download that in a PDF format. The uh, small book is uh, The Sounding of the Third Angel, a modern day uh, version of most of the chapters of the large book. And that's available in a PDF or in a print copy. Feel free to uh, access through my book website there, and we can send you as many copies as you would want. 
Coming up after we finish this book, uh, which will still be a few more months, but after we finish this, we will then be moving into studying the promise of the spirit by the same uh, Prescott that you saw referenced at the end of today's reading, who was speaking uh, the last couple of lines of today's chapter. And we'll be going through that book afterwards. So if you want to start reading up on it early, you can download the PDF or again, contact me through the website to get a free print copy or more. And lastly, there's a small book, a small pamphlet really that we've been uh, also receiving and uh, that we are distributing out to anybody who wants, and you can get that in PDF or print version as well, just by reaching out through the website. Those are my announcements. I'll turn it back to mom and dad. Okay, everyone, let's pray for one another. Let's pray pointedly along the lines of our contemplations, our study today, the things that we are now left with to think about and allow the Holy Spirit to have room in our hearts to just minister all the things that we have studied about today. As we have studied together here today, I am sure on your screen, or I am assuming that you can see what I can see too. You can see the screen with uh, pictures of people and their names. Go ahead, write them down. You might not know them. You might not know who Ashton is or who Marsha is. But write them down. God knows who they are. And as you study or review this, this um, chapter that we finished, or as you read the next one, pray for every person that the truth that we are sharing and receiving from that book that will become ours, will become Marcia's and Jan's and Mark's and Janet's and so forth, so that we can, that is the true fellowship. Fellowship is not so much to gather to just tell jokes and eat together. It is the fellowship of the spirit. And this is what it means. So even though we are separate and we cannot join except through Zoom, we can have fellowship in the spirit as we pray for one another in this way. And that's what we wish for everyone. We'll be doing the same as and well. One more thing for me, and that is to ask the Lord to help you to think about one person to be praying for and to invite to join us on our next Zoom study. And I should say, if you find someone, if somebody says, yes, I would like to join, please let Austin know so he can either give them the information as to as to the PDF, or you can give it to them too. Or if they need a book, a printed book, they'll come in the mail for him or for her. Please let him know. We need to know ahead of time so that they can also read it or at least have it in front of them to follow. It's easier for them. Okay, God bless you all. Till we see you again.